to our eAcademy webinar today with Abram Kilsmeyer jones and I'm just going to pass it right over to you, Abram. All right, thank you so much, Linda, and it's so good to be with you all today. I am Abram Kilsmeyer jones uh, Some of you will know me from other webinars that I lead. I am a pastor uh, at a church uh, north of Boston and just on the verge of accepting a call to a church actually in Boston. So I'll be in transition these next couple of months. Um, I've been in ministry for 20 some odd years, youth ministry, college ministry, worship music ministry, and pastoral ministry on a broader scale. Uh, and I've been using Accordance for um, not all of that time, but for a good chunk of that time. I, I think I came to Accordance with version 10 in 2012 or so. Um, and for the last six years, I've been leading different webinars on all manner of topics in Accordance. So I was uh, especially excited to have the opportunity to do this one, which is a topic that I've not led in these webinars. I've um, taught on apologetics in other contexts, but um, I'm really excited to talk with you all about apologetics in Accordance. Um, I minored in uh, philosophy in my undergrad, uh, and so there was a lot of philosophy of religion there, a lot of overlap with the kind of stuff we'll be talking about tonight, and got my MDiv in urban ministry. Um, I come to this topic as a pastor, as a, a person, we're all coming as, as humans who have certain goals and hopes and dreams in the world, um, but I, I come wanting to approach apologetics in a pastoral way, uh, and, and then also in an academically uh, rigorous and thorough way. I'm, I'm not a, a PhD or a professor, but I certainly enjoy teaching in church contexts and have found that my philosophy background has been helpful. So I, I hope to uh, present apologetics through those dual lenses, both the academic or the intellectual uh, and the, the personal, the, the practical. We'll see more of that as we go on. Um, so you've got in the handout section, you've got the PDF of my slides, uh, which are showing here. Um, and so before I start that slideshow, I just want to say that I'll be spending uh, roughly half and half, about half of our time uh, in the um, it, kind of teaching about apologetics. And just so you know who you're dealing with, let me make sure that my camera, there we go. So there I am. So I'll just wave to all of you. So there's a, a real life person on the other end. We're getting um, increasingly used to seeing each other uh, virtually, I, I suspect, uh, both in accordance and in other settings. But we're going to spend roughly the first half or so um, talking about what's here in um, the, the teaching uh, content that I want to share with you around apologetics. Uh, and then after that, we're going to get into accordance itself. Um, and we're going to do some demoing of some certain things. But I wanted to start with uh, some some setting up uh, of what apologetics is, and in particular, how uh, accordance can help you with that. Um, so again, in the handout section, uh, there's a PDF there. You can follow along or download that for later, uh, and, and let's dive right in. So by way of session description, uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says, but set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give a defense. And that's, you've got the Greek apologia there to all who ask you for an account of the hope that is in you. This workshop explores apologetics as a defense of the Christian faith. Of course, there are apologetics uh, that may not center around Christianity per se. Uh, you can think of other monotheistic religions that may have apologetic approaches or that may even share uh, similar arguments for the existence of God. Uh, I'm thinking specifically tonight about the defense of the Christian faith. Uh, what is the content of Christian apologetics? How do apologists approach their task? Uh, and then this workshop also highlights specific resources available in accordance, as well as showing you how to uh, navigate the app to answer some of the questions that you might have. So three main parts, I said two before, but there's really three main parts. The first is introduction to apologetics, and I'll do a little bit of teaching, my pastoral heart, my teaching heart, uh, will we'll come out through that in, in the mind that I try to bring to this, the practicality. Uh, and then the second major section is using accordance for apologetics. So I'll demo a couple of resources and, and features. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have some time for submitted questions. Uh, there is, as, as you may have seen already, a questions box uh, where you can submit questions along the way. Uh, we've got some other uh, staff who will be uh, attending to that. And But at the very end, uh, any questions that haven't been answered, uh, I'll take some time and we'll make sure that we've done our best to address those. 
Well, let's talk about uh, apologetics. Uh, let's let's define it. And this comes from uh, a resource in accordance. And you can see here it's called the Pocket Dictionary of Apologetics and Philosophy of Religion. Uh, in fact, if you it, if you look at uh, the the red circle, it's an app called Pinpoint. It shows my cursor. My cursor turns from uh, a cursor to a magnifier, or well, I guess it's a, a gloved hand. Um, that means that this is hyperlinked. So if you have this resource in accordance and you click on this hyperlink that I put in your uh, in your presentation here, it, it should take you right to the entry. So those of you who have this resource and want to look for yourself, uh, that's the citation information and it will take you right there in accordance. But here's how this uh, pocket dictionary defines apologetics. It says it's the rational defense of Christian faith. Historically, apologetic arguments of various types have been given. Philosophical arguments for the existence of God, arguments that the existence of God is compatible with suffering and evil. We're gonna go a little bit more in depth with that tonight. Historical arguments, such as arguments from miracles and fulfilled prophecies, and arguments from religious experience, including mystical experience. So you, you can see right away, uh, apologetics briefly defined as the defense of the Christian faith, but it, it branches out into these other uh, categories and particular pieces of content and even methodology, ways that you approach it. Uh, this blue underline is not hyperlinked in your handout, but if you were to look up this entry in accordance, uh, this would take you to the entry for miracles, the entry for religious experience. One of the things that's uh, great about Accordance is that uh, there's hyperlinking all throughout lots and lots of modules. So that's one way to understand apologetics. You'll notice the ellipsis here. I didn't put the full definition there, uh, but if you have that resource, you can click on it. And if you don't have that resource, Accordance will tell you and it will take you to the link where you can uh, pick it up in the store. It's not very expensive if you don't have it. So here's another definition of apologetics. This comes from the Apologetics Study Bible. Uh, I want to say this is Ken Boa, if I recall correctly, uh, who's writing this part of the Bible. But again, you could find that if you clicked on this. And I wanted to read this a little bit longer, but it's, it's worth considering as we begin. Apologetics may be simply defined as the defense of the Christian faith. So we saw that just in the slide before, right? Defense of the Christian faith. Uh, the simplicity of this definition, however, masks the complexity of the problem of defining apologetics. It turns out that a diversity of approaches has been taken in defining the meaning, scope, and purpose of apologetics. The word apologetics derives from the Greek word apologia, which was originally used as a speech of defense. In ancient Athens, it referred to a defense made in the courtroom as part of the normal judicial procedure. After the accusation, the defendant was allowed to refute the charges with the defense, the classic example of an apologia was Socrates' defense against the charge of preaching strange gods, a defense retold by his most famous pupil, Plato, in a dialogue called The Apology. Uh, this is very helpful background information, and whether you know Greek or not, it, there, there is actually a Greek cultural connection to this word, too, that here's the historical context in which this arose. Now, if you were to look at this article or do further research in accordance, you may be curious, well, okay, that's several centuries still before uh, the New Testament. And so how do we get from uh, apologetics in this sense to the same Greek word being used in Peter? This entry uh, in the Apologetic Study Bible, it's in the, I believe it's in the introductory material. It will go on to describe that. And uh, that may just be something you'd want to check out more is, is the history of the word. Uh, we've got other uh, resources that I can point to that, that can talk about that. But there's a, a simplicity in uh, saying what apologetics is, the defense of the Christian faith, but once you get past that, uh, the the what and the how, and and even how far does it go? What you know, what's theology versus what's philosophy? What's apologetics versus what's uh, belief that you know maybe I don't feel like I need to justify? And, and how do you justify Th that kind of stuff? You'll find you, your mileage will vary depending on who you're reading or or what you believe or who you're talking to. Uh, but basically understood is the defense of the Christian faith. So this is a resource. It's not in accordance, but it's an excellent resource. James Sire, The Universe Next Door. And um, we won't go in depth with each of these tonight uh, just because of the limited nature of our time. But I, I wanted to equip you with something. Uh, it, this, this, I think, has been, for me, the most helpful framework that I've had 
to answer this question of what are the questions? What questions does apologetics ask? Or we could say, if apologetics is a defense, what is it defending? Well, it's defending the Christian answers, the Christian worldview answers to these questions. So these categories uh, really help when you want to move from, okay, let's do apologetics to what are the actual topics I need to research? I have used this um, a, a handout along these lines with young people as a youth minister. Uh, and, and so I, I think this is accessible to anybody that you might be talking to or having these conversations about. Um, and of course, these are, are deeply personal questions as well. So without uh, unpacking each one, just to read these through, uh, James Sire defines a worldview as how you view yourself, others, the world, and God. Of course, other people might use language like God's your higher power, uh, supreme being. Uh, of course, for Christians, there's God, capital G. But Sire says that a worldview answers these seven basic questions. What is ultimate reality or the really real? That's the meaning of life question. Why are we here? What's it all for? Uh, what is the nature of external reality? That is the world around us. So ultimate reality uh, may overlap with external reality to some extent, but there may be an extent to which ultimate reality goes beyond just the external reality that we can perceive around us. And again, how people answer that question is going to vary wildly, but those are the sorts of questions and tasks of apologetics uh, to make a defense for how a Christian worldview would answer these questions. What is a human being? Are we uh, at worst a random collection of atoms? At best, are we demigods? Are we somewhere in between? Of course, the classic Christian answer is uh, it usually begins with we are made in the image of God. And that, of course, has overlap uh, with Judaism as that comes in Genesis 1. Another question, what is the meaning of human history? Uh, of course, the, the Christian worldview answers that it, it leads up to and culminates uh, in, in a sense with, with Jesus at the cross and the resurrection. And then there's the second coming and this grand culmination where God makes all things new. What is the meaning of human history? What happens to a person at death? So that's the question of the afterlife. Uh, and then this really interesting question, which as a philosophy major, I especially appreciated. How is it possible to know anything at all? Do I really know what I say that I know? And if so, how? And if I'm reasonably confident that I know a thing, how can I communicate that to someone else? And should they automatically know that thing as well? And, and what if they don't? And uh, w w what is the source of my knowledge? Um, of course, Christian, uh, the Christian worldview would answer that uh, some combination of scripture as God's revelation, um, depending on your uh, tradition. Uh, Christian tradition carries a certain amount of weight. So you think about the early church councils and the creeds who sort of pulled some of these foundational beliefs together. Uh, for example, the word Trinity, you may know is not in the Bible, but the doctrine of the Trinity would be considered an orthodox, classic doctrine of the Christian faith uh, that came about through uh, those first centuries of folks coming through the scripture. So we, we know that, or we believe that we know that God exists as Trinity through scripture but also tradition, and then reason and experience play a certain role. So how is it possible to know anything at all? And then there's also this great question of how should we behave? What should we do about it? Ethics and morality, knowing right from wrong. And of course, the Christian worldview gives you uh, love God and love your neighbor as yourself as two very fundamental ways of, of being and acting in the world. And there are lots of ways that those uh, commandments get unpacked and, and fleshed out throughout scripture. So how does apologetics answer questions is what I want to look at next. If, if we've been looking at what questions does apologetics ask, what's some of the content uh, of apologetics, then how does the apologist go about her or his task? What's the approach? What's the method? If we were to go back to that verse in 1 Peter, for example, there's already a suggestion there. Well, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's in the imperative. Uh, do this with gentleness and respect. So there's there's something to how you defend your faith, how you give a reason for the hope that is in you. Uh, Peter wants to say, Peter, inspired by God, wants to say it's not just the content, it's also the how. How do you do it? And, and he says gentleness uh, and, and respect. And of course, we could look at other verses too. But let me just suggest three uh, broad categories uh, to keep in mind as we do apologetics. And again, this is not uh, specific to accordance 
we'll continue on in this way for just a little while longer. But I, I want to give us a really big setup before we get into a case study that we'll use accordance to help us with. Because I think it can be easy to default to, you know, apologetics is just proving a point and proving that you're right and that's it. Uh, but but humanity is is more complex than that. Uh, and apologetics is richer and deeper than that in its tradition. Um, you can think about uh, any well-known apologist is, is going to be quick to say it's not just the head. Uh, and so I've, I've put these three categories here um, that apologetics uses uh, the, the head or belief. So there's the intellectual, and that might be the first place we go when we hear the word apologetics. So there's the intellectual, there's the cognitive. What can I know? How can I know it? What's, how does this make sense logically? Um, there is the heart or feelings. That's the affective. Um, so it may be that I have no problem believing a thing intellectually, but I'm just not feeling it. And uh, what should I do about that? And maybe the answer is I don't need to do anything about that because I don't always feel things. But what about my feelings? Aren't they important? And what about feelings in general? And what about love of God, not just as an abstract concept, but as something that I actually experience and feel in a very real incarnate, incarnated way? So head, heart, and hands. You'll see this tri this uh, threefold distinction uh, from others. I, I did not make this up, but but you'll see this in lots of contexts. So head, heart, and hands. And so that's action. That's the practical. And so it it may be uh, that that the belief is there for you, the feelings are there, but there's still this question of of the practical. How how are we living this out? Uh, and in apologetics, I think when it's at its best, uh, considers all three of these approaches. Uh, together with each other. And I should just say, as, as a way of disclaimer, um, there's overlap between these three. Um, these are not, you know, it's not as if you can separate your head and your heart and your hands. There's certainly overlap, and um, this is not necessarily sequential. And again, folks will have different ideas about how they all interrelate. But broadly speaking, just to have some categories to consider, I wanted to present these to you uh, so that you're, as you're taking what you know and what you've experienced and who you are and you're having conversations or just thinking about this stuff on your own, um, thinking through these three different lens, uh, lenses, I, I think can be really helpful. Head, heart, and hands. Oh, this is a beautiful poem for the asking by Denise Levertov. And let me just um, read this and, and show you what I mean by head, heart, and hands working together. Augustine said his soul was a house so cramped God could barely squeeze in. Knock down the mean partitions, he prayed, so you may enter. Raise the oppressive ceilings. Augustine's soul didn't become a mansion large enough to welcome, along with God, the women he'd loved, except for his mother, though one, perhaps his son's mother, did remain to inhabit a small dark room. God, therefore, would never have felt fully at home as his guest. Nevertheless, it's clear desire fulfilled itself in the asking, revealing prayer's dynamic action that scoops out channels like water on stone or builds like layers of grainy sediment steadily forming sandstone. The walls with each thought, each feeling, each word he set down expanded unnoticed. The roof rose in a skylight opened. I love this poem, and it is a great uh, example of Augustine and, and how for him, head, heart, and hands really did work together. That was true for his whole life before his powerful conversion experience, and it was certainly true afterwards. You think about his autobiographical confessions and how they are written in the first and second person. They read as an extended prayer, even while he's doing some pretty heavy intellectual lifting the affect is very important there for Augustine. And there's something in the action too, that hands piece of, of, of it, that prayer has a dynamic action. It scoops out channels like water on stone. You may not even be aware of it unnoticed, but as you pray, the roof can rise and a skylight can open, your heart can open up to God. So I just, I find this a lovely poem and I would be happy to spend the whole hour just hearing what you think about this and reflecting on this together, but I'll have to leave that to you all for further reflection. But it's just to say Augustine, one of the church's foremost apologists and and one of the church's best minds, um, I, I think this uh, Levertov poem is a really good read of Augustine and his approach. And so you have the head, the heart, and the hands all working in tandem together. 
uh, in my opinion, that's apologetics when it is at its at its best and its fullest and its richest. So we've seen head, heart, and hands. This is how apologetics answers questions. I want to look a little bit more uh, just briefly at each, and then we'll move into a case study, uh, which will take us into accordance before long. So the head, belief. And I'm thinking in terms of three directions here for each of these three. So I'll give you an upward, an inward, and an outward. Again, there's probably some oversimplifying here, uh, but just for the sake of having a framework, I wanted to present this. First, there's upward. When we think about the intellect, we think about how do we know that, that question of epistemology? And again, the Christian worldview answers, and not just the Christian worldview, but it, you'd see this in other religious worldviews, but, but our answer would be God. It's through revelation. I know uh, in, in my head because it's been given, it's been revealed to me. So I, I guess I could call this downward uh, if, if you think metaphorically of, about God is up there and, and we're down here. So uh, the, the head stuff comes through revelation, uh, scripture, uh, Jesus Christ as revelation uh, and, and so on. There's a lot more we could say about that, but I just want to give this outline here. And then there's an inward component, I think, to, to the head. You know, what, what's going on in my head? How do I view the world? Uh, so that's me. That's the worldview question. And then there's an outward component here. This is the you, uh, the, the, the second person, the you that you might be talking to or other people. This might be how we think about apologetics proper. It's the, the rational conversation that we might have with another person uh, or engagement we might have with them around particular topics. Uh, but there is this upward movement, this uh, up and down revelation that happens uh, that uh, the Christian worldview believes that that's how we know anything. Uh, and then there's this inward movement of worldview and kind of working that out before I even talk to anybody, maybe. Or as I talk to someone, maybe I go away and, and inwardly reflect on what I've been discussing outwardly. So that's the head belief. Uh, and then uh, we've talked about this question already, but I think a chief question here is how do we know? What are the possible limits to our knowledge? Uh, and then there's the heart feelings, another useful lens through which to think about apologetics. And again, if we do upward, inward, outward, we've got God, and that's the relational piece. So uh, regardless of what I believe or what I know to be true or what I think I should believe, uh, what is my relationship like with God? And uh, is this belief um, leading me to praise? You know, is there is there some, can there be a doxological, uh, a praise-oriented posture to apologetics? Is it more than just a dry philosophical exercise for me? And not the philosophy is dry, but in my internalizing it uh, in my relationship to God uh, is, is the question that we ask there. And uh, that uh, connects to the inward turn and how am I feeling about this and how am I feeling in the presence of God? And there's a very real pastoral element too to apologetics. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about the problem of evil in a little bit here. And it may be that the person you're talking to or listening to um, is not really connecting with the logical reasons for the problem of evil. In fact, uh, just pastorally speaking, and your experience may differ, but I have found that, that folks in their moments of greatest pain, the best thing that I know to do with them is just to sit with them in that pain and to mourn with them in the presence of God. Um, not to say, well, this happened because this, this, and this. They may eventually want to talk about that. And if they ask me that, yes, let's talk about that. But there's a pastoral piece to this too, that again, apologetics is not just, uh, well, let, let's figure this out uh, you know, in, in five different points and hopefully your feelings will follow. I think there's room in apologetics to consider uh, this, this pastoral sort of interaction. Um, I think about this great song by the worship leader, Matt Redman. He um, defines worship as our heart responding to your revelation. So there's that revelation piece. And in fact, this is one way in which the head and the heart are one. We are, we are not uh, dissected as humans. We are one whole being. And when we think about the ways that our hearts respond to God's revelation, um, I think he captures that well. I love this verse in Mark. I believe, help my unbelief. So there's some intellectual ascent there. Uh, this is the man who, uh, whose son is, is possessed by an evil spirit. He comes to Jesus and asks if it's possible to heal him. And, and Jesus says, you know, are, <laughs> are you kidding me? Uh, and, and the guy, of course, it's possible. And the guy says, yeah, I believe. Help my unbelief. So there's this intellectual affirmation here, but this very real visceral emotional plea, help my unbelief. And then you've got Psalm 139, search me, God, and know my heart. Beautiful passage to pray as we 
uh, think about the topics of apologetics. And then there's the hands. And so again, thinking upward between us and God, there's something about belief that has to do with volition and obedience. And so it's more than just intellect and feelings. Uh, I think about Thomas, uh, who doubts Jesus, and Jesus is gracious and meets him where he's at and shows him his hands. But there comes a point where Jesus says, stop doubting and believe. There's a, a choice almost that Thomas has to make, that he's gotten the evidence, and now there's the decision. There's this act of volition. So that's something, too, I would want to keep in mind when doing apologetics. Again, that it's not just about uh, proving the right doctrine or even uh, having your feelings somehow in sync with that. Sometimes um, there, there feels like there's this leap. You've gotten as far as you can with head and heart, uh, and or maybe you start with the the belief as volition. But hands, I, I think, really speaks to the practical kind of in the world nature of apologetics, belief and volition. Inwardly, we might think about apathy and dryness, those seasons that we feel, uh, and then outwardly, just questions to raise. Uh, some folks uh, have had the experience that belonging for them comes before believing. It's a phrase that if you hang around in church circles long enough, you might hear that belonging comes before believing. So maybe somebody came to a dinner or, uh, you know, something or even just a Sunday service and came for a couple months before they actually professed faith. So that's, again, something to consider. I, I'm not sure you're going to find, you know, how to manuals in accordance for something like hospitality in the church. But as you're looking through apologetics resources, as we'll do, uh, thinking about that question, does belonging come before believing? How does that impact? how I build relationships and I think about my own apologetic calling, the call to evangelism and discipleship. What about belonging for other people? And of course, you'll you'll be very familiar with cultural critiques of Christianity. The top one being, you know, all Christians are hypocrites. Why should I believe anyway? If that's the stumbling block that the person you're talking to is dealing with, um, the head and the heart piece may not go as far uh, because there's very practical pieces there. They, they may believe and feel everything about God, that you do, but but they can't get into the church because of maybe how they've been hurt or something like that. So that's another piece. And I just want to highlight uh, that as we uh, think about apologetics before. Uh, here's a verse from Ecclesiastes, a uh, verse from Deuteronomy, I've set before you life and death. It speaks to the volitional nature that the choice that faith can be. Uh, and, and so I've, you know, hands is an imperfect analogy, but th there's something very practical about that uh, supplements the apologetic task. Let's do our case study, the problem of evil, which you all came for tonight, or I don't know. You came to see accordance, and I, I promise we'll get to accordance, but this is what we're going to use accordance to figure out, or <laughs> I'm not going to, that's over-promising. We won't figure it out. Uh, you might, and if you do, let me know, but um, we'll, we'll try to make some progress on understanding this. The problem of evil, a case study. So this is formulated in different ways. In fact, as we go to our accordance resources, we'll even see it formulated in different ways. Uh, I, I've seen a three-point version of this, a four-point version. Here's a five-point version. Number one, God exists. Number two, God knows everything, omnipotent. Uh, I'm sorry, that's omniscient. I apologize for that typo, and I'll get that corrected. Uh, so God is all-knowing. That's omniscience. God is all-loving and good, omnibenevolence. God is all-powerful, uh, omnipotent. But evil exists and persists. So the problem of evil then is that if God exists and knows about evil, that's omniscience, and loves all creation, that's omnibenevolence, and if God can stop evil, that's omnipotence, if all of numbers one through four are true, why is number five also true? So the problem of evil is how do all five of these things exist in reality together as all being true? Well, so here's what some have proposed. And just to note again, uh, omniscience is the the word for all knowing here. I apologize for that typo. Uh, here's, here's one proposal to this. So if we've got these five propositions and, and the problem of evil is how do all of these truths exist together? I mean, on a visceral level, the problem of evil is there's pain and there's suffering and it hurts and it's terrible. And I thought God loved me. Uh, when, you, when you get to actually writing out the propositions, this is why that's a problem. This is why a person has that visceral response. So here's, here's a proposed solution. Uh, number one, there is no God. And so that would be the, the solution of an atheist or, or perhaps an agnostic might posit that there may not be a God or, or we can't know. Uh, so that, that solves the problem of evil. Uh, you know, the numbers two through five, or I'm sorry, numbers two through four become irrelevant if there is no God. Uh, another option, number two, God is good and loving and can stop any evil, but God doesn't know about every evil. 
Um, the, you won't see this in every formulation of the problem of evil, but some of them do. God's just not aware. And, and if God were aware, he would stop it, but he's not. So God's not omniscient. Uh, another possible solution, God knows about and can stop any evil, but he doesn't love us enough to, uh, which is sort of, sort of a, uh, a rough charge to, to try to answer um, as a Christian. Another possible solution, God knows about evil and even wants to stop it out of love, but is not powerful enough to. Uh, and so God's power is somehow limited, or, or maybe God is sort of more stuck in the unfolding of real time with us than, than we thought. And that would explain why, like, for example, if God didn't know the future, maybe he wouldn't be able to prevent something that was about to happen because he couldn't see it coming. So that's one proposal. These are not my proposals, uh, but these are, are some proposals you hear. And then another proposal, evil does not really exist or it's an illusion. Uh, and, and some version of that, and this is grossly oversimplifying, but if you uh, look at Buddhism, there it, it, there's a, a centering on uh, detachment uh, from evil that doesn't necessarily say there's no such thing as evil, but it, it talks about a, a sort of detachment and it, it it sort of gets into this realm of, you know, number five is the one that's incompatible uh, with, with these things. So how does apologetics answer these questions? Again, we had head, heart, and hands. So very briefly, um, I'll just give you an overview and then we'll go look for answers in accordance ourselves. But uh, the, the intellectual uh, response to the problem of evil would be the free will argument, an appeal to logic. God created humanity with free choice, and so we're going to use that free choice to hurt each other, whether on purpose or on accident. Uh, and, and God has set up the world in such a way that his love for us means he doesn't interfere with or override our free choice, uh, at least not consistently. And so in an a intellectual sense, that's, that's one explanation for the problem of evil. A hard explanation for the problem of evil might be that there's some greater good at play. So that's an appeal to feelings. Numbers one through five are true, uh, but there's some greater good that evil is um, made sense of. And, and maybe we know this greater good. Maybe we sort of know it. Maybe we won't know till later. And then this hands uh, approach to the problem of evil. And this is what I was talking about earlier um, when I'm thinking pastorally ab about the problem of evil is just to lament evil. Uh, when Lazarus died, it's not that that was an evil act per se, but there was something amiss about that, that it was not as it should be. His sisters were weeping and Jesus wept too. So there's a, a call to action there, lament, uh, that is an appropriate response. I think that's an appropriate response to the problem of evil. All right. How can accordance help? Uh, these are the last couple slides of the presentation. We're going to move into accordance for the next section, but I put some lists uh, here, uh, both of resources and features. Uh, these are all hyperlinked. Um, so just a, a handful of, of resources you might want to consider. One is the Apologetic Study Bible, and I'll show that to you. The other is the Pocket Handbook, uh, Peter Kreft. I'll be uh, showing that as well. There's also a Pocket Dictionary of Apologetics. Accordance has just released this two-volume history of apologetics split into two main eras, and it's got a lot of source readings. Uh, that, that I'll, I'll show you that as well. And then uh, John Warwick Montgomery, a, a full collection of his resources. And then commentaries, don't forget commentaries. You're, any commentary worth its salt is gonna address the difficult questions that come up in the biblical text. So you might even take your simplest one volume commentary uh, and you know when you read about something in the text and it doesn't make sense to you or, or strikes you in a negative way, uh, commentaries, don't forget about commentaries. That's a great place to look. So we're gonna look at the info pane we're going to look at search fields in a module. We're going to do research and amplify. I'm going to show you how to create your own user group. And we're going to, along the way, do a little bit with user-created tools, namely the stack and the user tool uh, that will help us track our findings and our observations. So these are the resources we're going to use. These are the features we're going to use. And there's much more you could do, but I, I want to keep it simple. And the reason, again, for the extensive introduction is I want us to have a sense of what it is we're trying to do before we even get to accordance. This has been uh, one of the most helpful ways I've found to use accordance is to just take some time to know what it is that I'm after, to know what my approach is. Uh, something like apologetics is, is much more than just what you can do on a computer screen. Uh, although high school, Abram Kilsmeyer Jones didn't know that. And so I was in AOL chat rooms arguing with people defending my faith. And, you know, God can use anything. And maybe God used that, but that's not how I would approach it now. I would fill out the head with the heart and the hands. 
Uh, so just have those in mind as, as you approach accordance. But, but then when you get to accordance, you'll be able to use it in a really effective and powerful way because you know what you're looking for. You know, for example, that you may have a friend who is in deep pain right now. And what they're looking for is some sort of relational encouragement that God is not absent. And so you would be approaching your apologetics resources with that particular piece, that affective piece. So as we use accordance, uh, we, I would just brainstorm, and I might do this uh, in a text edit document, or I might um, I might just do this in my head, but I would want to brainstorm, how are we going to find uh, the problem of evil uh, in accordance? Uh, how are we going to find the, the problem of evil uh, in accordance? And so, it, it was, it, and I asked that question because the phrase problem of evil, I mean, I can just show you accordance, uh, I'm certain, uh, that it does not occur in the Bible. So that's not gonna help us much. Um, so we're gonna need to think about other words like theodicy, and you may or may not know that word, but um, it, it'll come up eventually. And so, okay, all right, maybe we search for theodicy, but like the word Trinity, that's not in the Bible. So we need to try something else, suffering, evil, sin. So we could try any of those. Okay, now I've got something, I've got sufferings. In fact, here we have right away, Exodus 3, 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And there's a comma there. So we, I mean, that's already powerful to me, right? Just to think about God, God knows the sufferings of his people. And there is some encouragement in that. Or, well, maybe not for everybody. Maybe some people think, well, if he knows my sufferings, why doesn't he stop them? But there's at least this, this wonderful relational acknowledgement here. Uh, this uh, button here, this is called the context slider. And um, depending on how you have your preferences set, if your search results are just giving you individual verses, you can slide this context slider just a couple notches to the right. Or you can go to A, uh, which is all. That will show you all text. That way you can see, all right, God knows their sufferings and, and what? And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. And talking about the promised land here. So this already gives us some insight into the problem of evil, that God knows the evil that befalls his children. God delivers uh, sometimes uh, people from evil, even uh, it looks like, uh, you know, I, I would venture to say that the, the free will, <laughs> the choice of the Egyptians would not be to have them delivered. Uh, they wanted to keep those slaves. So there, there's something even there where God seems to override the preferences of the Egyptians. Uh, so that's going to be germane to our search. But getting back to this, I, I just I, I want to take a little bit of time at the beginning of any study I do and make sure I'm looking for the right thing. Um, you're going to find theodicy not in the Bible, not that word, but if you have different tools to look at, you're going to find theodicy in those tools. Um, let's just look at a couple more of these and, and we'll get deeper into accordance. Other relevant verses to explore. So I might just jot down some notes at this point. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll show you right now how to make a stack. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've got uh, such great help documentation right up here in the help menu. Uh, accordance 13 has these tutorials which are interactive uh, and excellent. You can go down. There's one here, user tools. Uh, these will be just added to in the future. Of course, I'm just creating more work for our developers, so I, I shouldn't promise that. But they have been added to since Accordance 13 came out. More and more tutorials and lots of other help files, podcasts, webinars, seminars, uh, documentation. It's excellent stuff there. Um, so you can learn more about Stacks there. But just for now, if I've got my toolbar showing here, um, which I can hide or show my toolbar, but if I've got the Stacks there, I can click on Stack, click and hold. And I'm going to go to new stack, and I'm going to call this problem of evil. Click on OK. And now it opens up this blank canvas here, which is going to get filled up pretty soon. But I'm going to start by adding a user item. And you can see the different uh, components of these items in the stack. Here's a, a timestamp, which is really convenient, especially if you're recording your own observations. And you're wondering, when did I think that brilliant thought? Oh, that was five years ago. Or, oh, yeah, that was just yesterday. Um, or why was I thinking that? Well, you've got the timestamp, so that can at least help you a little bit. Uh, so you can, you've got a title here. 
you've got a little comment bubble and you've got some contents here. I might just uh, put here um, in the new user item in the title, I might just put uh, brainstorm. I might type that in and then I'll go back to this. In fact, I might even just copy this right out of the handout and go to the contents and paste that in. And so now this has my notes here. So now I've, I've moved out of Keynote or, or the PDF, I guess you've got. Um, and I, I can put all my stuff right here in the stack. So I can see here, and you can make the font bigger if you want. Um, these are gonna be some of the things I'm gonna look at. Uh, the word theodicy in my tools. Here are some words that I am pretty sure are gonna be in the Bible. Um, and then I just have this note here, are there other relevant verses to explore? Maybe, uh, you know, Genesis one through three, where, where um, it, it was perfect and then it wasn't. Um, so that's gonna have something about the problem of evil, I suspect. Um, th these are some of the other methods that we're going to go through. You can do a topic search in Bible texts. We'll do that. There's a great tool, Outlines of Bible Books. Uh, we're looking at a stack and a user tool. And then I'm also going to want in my brainstorming session to have other questions that are related. So if, if my case study is the problem of evil and how can accordance help me figure that out, um, a, a related question is the existence of God. And I'm just going to write that down uh, before I forget, because these are all search terms that I'll use for my various tools and uh, texts that I've got in accordance. Now, this list was uh, me sitting down and, and brainstorming, how am I going to find about the problem of evil in accordance? Your list may look different. You, have may, you may have more ideas. Uh, you may have better ideas. You may only have two or three ideas, and that's fine. But I think it's worth, especially with such a big topic, taking the time to get your bearings, put it in a stack. So again, add a stack, um, new stack. And now this will be your live stack. So in anything that you add to this uh, will go into the stack. So I'm gonna keep this stack here and we've got this list. And so we'll sort of go back and forth between these bullet points for the rest of our time together, um, as well as these different features and these resources. Um, but I'm, I just, I don't wanna lose this verse. I've just seen, First try, you know, I look for suffering, and I saw this great passage uh, in Exodus 3 that speaks to God's presence even when there is evil or suffering. And surely this is not just suffering, but actual evil because it is affliction. Uh, the word evil itself is not used in English here, but it, it wouldn't take much reading through the context to to find that, you know, God views the ways that the Egyptians are treating the Israelites as evil. So let me take this um i'll just take this whole section i'm going to select it and i'm going to right click now and i'm going to add this selection to my stack so what this is going to do is just copy and paste this whole passage right into my problem of evil stack um, so you can see here there's a keyboard shortcut uh, i can go to add selection to stack by right clicking you could actually go back to this add to stack button up here and just single click it and now it adds that whole passage into my stack. It populated the title with the passage, Exodus 3, 7 through 12. Uh, it, this text is not editable now because it's a quote. It kept the bold formatting, which is nice. It showed me what word I was searching for. Timestamp, comment bubble can go right here. Uh, first use of the word suffering. Uh, or maybe I just put something like God is present when his people suffer or something like that. Uh, I might have questions. Uh, why does God deliver from some evils and not others? Uh, what about people who have died in slavery at the hands of abusive and ungodly taskmasters? What do I do about that? Um, in fact, that might even raise the question, what about slavery in the US? So whatever my questions are, I'll put them here. And it's really easy as you go through a topic to end with more questions than you started with. Uh, again, you can decide these these may be ones for later, but at least for now, this stack will allow me to put comments there with any given verse. And then I would proceed through more uh, hits on sufferings. I'm not going to go through all of these right now, but uh, but you may want to. Um, here's uh, just looking at Job. I became afraid of all my suffering, for I know you will not hold me innocent. And I can just extend the context slider. Uh, and I'm not going to read through that all right now, but let me just take this verse and, uh, you know, in, in, in real life, and if, if I had extended time doing the study or if you were doing it, um, you might want to read through that passage. But one of the questions that I have here is uh, what about the evil that happened to Job, even though 
he was, I think the word is blameless in Job 1. And I could just check that by going to Job 1, which that's Job 12. Uh, man in the land, blameless and upright. So there it is. Uh, blameless and upright. So what about the evil that happened to Job, even though he was blameless? So again, there's a question. Uh, I might even make an observation here that there's some connection between uh, suffering and innocence and being held to account. Again, I, we won't be able to chase that all down right now, but um, I would make my way through these hit results here with the word suffering and just continually add to the stack uh, these verses. I might also um, at this point, add to the user item a category uh, or two, which is um, God's uh, involvement in suffering. So even as I have this Exodus uh, 3, 7 through 12 passage, I might just make this, this unique user item uh, in, in just you know bullet points here, God and Israelites in Exodus or, or something like that. So again, th these stacks are meant to be really flexible, but you can put all your, your findings there. Um, so that is the, uh, th that's just looking for suffering. And then again, you can do the same thing, evil and sin. So let's see what the Bible has to say about evil. There's lots there, tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. We're just gonna pretend that we did an in-depth study on Genesis one through three, and we're gonna add this to the stack. And we're gonna put our brilliant conclusions about the origin of evil right here. And so that will go there. And then, of course, we'll add that to this item on the stack, uh, X, Y, Z, whatever else. I'm kind of short circuiting the process, but I want to share with you as much as possible in terms of what you could actually do. Um, all right. So evil, sin, I would search other Bible texts. Now, we haven't searched tools yet, and that would be an important step. Accordance is, broadly speaking, uh, divided into texts and tools. Uh, it, well, it's not just text and tools, but if you look here, you've got texts and tools, uh, texts being all of your primary sources. So certainly that would be scripture, but you, you can already see here apostolic fathers, any primary text. And then tools would be a secondary source that would comment usually on that primary text. Uh, the tools are going to give me things like the word theodicy. So I might just go to a dictionary or better yet, I might just type in apologetics and find that pocket apologetics dictionary. Now I'm gonna open it. And uh, this is where I'm gonna use the search field. I, I mentioned this in the uh, keynote uh, here, search fields in a module. Uh, Accordance um, uh, sets up its modules so that you can search a module in a number of specific targeted ways. It's, it's more than just if you were gonna do command F or control F on a web page or a Word document. You can actually search by the specific tags that Accordance puts uh, with the coding when it when it puts the module together. Uh, and I tell you that because when you're using a dictionary, more often than not, the starting place will be entry. And so for here, I will put theodicy. Now notice as I'm typing, uh, I start typing T-H-E. Accordance gives me this quick entry list of words here. Uh, these are not all the words in the English language that begin with the letters T-H-E. These are all the words in the pocket apologetics dictionary, all of the entries that begin with T-H-E. So I can see very quickly what sorts of entries there actually are. So sure enough, here's the Odyssey. And here's uh, a, a paragraph on that, an answer to the problem of evil that attempts to justify the ways of God to man. I don't know who that quotation is from, by explaining God's reasons for allowing evil. Two of the more important theodicies, this is good stuff for our search, are the soul-making theodicy, which argues that God allows evil so as to make it possible for humans to develop certain desirable virtues, and the free will theodicy, which argues that God had to allow for the possibility of evil if he wished to give humans free will. All right, so we talked about free will a little bit earlier, and soul-making theodicy, when I said that maybe in this argument, uh, for how evil can coexist with God. I, I talked about maybe there's some greater good beyond evil that it, it, in the light of which evil makes more sense. That's the soul-making theodicy. Uh, whether you believe, and faithful Christians, of course, disagree on this, whether you believe that God uh, is ordaining a particular evil or merely allowing it, or, or I should say ordaining suffering uh, or allowing it, that, that God would not be um, one who does evil, but one who could either ordain suffering or allow it. Again, I suspect on this uh, webinar, we've got different takes on that. And maybe within yourself, you're <laughs> divided on that. Either way, 
uh, those evils or, or those um, the, the sufferings, uh, whether uh, they're allowed or ordained, uh, have a soul making function. Um, I think about the story of Joseph and when his brothers sell him into slavery. Uh, and um, he says to his brothers, you intended it for evil. You, the brothers, intended it for evil, not that God did in that instance, but that God intended it for good. And so God brought some good out of that. That's a soul-making theodicy. I'm going to just take that and add that to my stack because that's good stuff. Now, what I don't have to worry about really is citation because the stacks do that for you. Uh, so you've got, there aren't quotation marks here, but the color of the stack item tells you that this is from uh, something else. And in fact, you've got the source information right here. So I know this is not my own uh, explanation of theodicy. Uh, in fact, as I close that, my cursor, as I hover over the source information, turns to a magnifying glass, which means this is clickable. This is hyperlink. You can click on this, whether it's the cover image or the title here. Now, when I do that, conveniently, Accordance goes right back to that very entry. I didn't have Pocket Apologetics Dictionary open. I may be looking at this stack a month from now. I may have forgotten I own this module, but it takes me right back to that module. So there's some great stuff there. Uh, soul making theodicy is something I want to look at. So I'm going to add that to, I don't know, somewhere in my stack. I might just say here, uh, soul making theodicy, uh, God allowing suffering versus ordaining how does that work? <laughs> I'll just leave that there for now. But I, I just want to add that note there as well. But I've got this quotation now on uh, theodicy. So the search fields are the entry took me right to what I wanted. Now, that may not be enough for you. And maybe you want to stay in this resource. You can change the search field to English content, type in theodicy, and you're going to get now 11 hits. Let me just make this zone a little bit easier to see. Um, so now you've got theodicy, not just where it occurs in an entry, but where it occurs um, in the actual body of that entry. So not just the title, but the body. Uh, so this is helpful. I might not have thought to look up problem of evil. I, I probably would have, but in case I didn't, it shows me that theodicy is mentioned there. This hyperlinks to free will defense. I can follow that. There's theodicy again. So there's a lot more that I've got here. I can do the same thing, add it to the stack and be on my way. Uh, I wonder, I just want to go back to theodicy and see if there's anything about the soul making theodicy. And it doesn't look like there is um, per se. So we can come back to that later. Uh, yeah, I'm not finding soul making in there. Um, but uh, you can decide again how much within the same dictionary you want to go uh, integrate your depth, or you can just go to another one. So let's go to the Apologetic Study Bible. Now that has. Um, it's a study Bible, so it follows your Bible verse by verse, but it also has some introductory material, like what is apologetics. Uh, Ken Boa, yeah, that's the, the quote I had earlier, um, uh, plan of salvation. But you can also search your study Bible for English content, so you might just search the word theodicy. Now, this is going to be a really good bridge between words that don't exist in the Bible and concepts that exist in the Bible. Uh, well, we just got one hit here, but uh, English content theodicy, you know, I, I may want to see, okay, Job 21, 7 through 15, what's that about? So I can hover over this and click and hold for instant details. I may choose to click that and research that passage further uh, as the word theodicy uh, has occurred here in the Apologetic Study Bible. Um, so if uh, theodicy is anywhere in this uh, particular um, tool, it's going to show up. So that's the tool uh, uh, module, the, the, the tool category of modules, I should say, in accordance, uh, that you can search it for words that may or may not appear in scripture. What you can even do, uh, which is, you know, not just combing through individual modules all at once, is the research feature. So I can go to File, New Tab, and Research, and I can just type in the word theodicy and say, I want to find that in all of my tools or all of my texts. Let's just try all texts because I'm pretty sure, yeah, we'll get nothing. Uh, so that that was searching every primary text I have, Bible and otherwise, and there was nothing there. So I could expand the search to all tools, or I could just do all. Uh, and then in the research search, you've got subcategories here if you just wanted to home in on one. Um, again, we, we've got more help documentation on the research function and, and some good webinars on that too, if you want to go further. But uh, let's say you just go to all. So research the Odyssey in all, 
And uh, depending on the size of your library, uh, and uh, you know, if you've done a research search in a while, it, it might take a little while. Um, I've, I, I don't know if I can scientifically prove this, but experientially it's true that after I've run a few research searches on uh, coordinates in a given session, they, they tend to go a little bit faster. But what this will do is it will search your entire library, hopefully it won't crash it uh, as it just did here. Um, I like to crash accordance in every webinar to show you this screen right here. Well, that's not true, uh, but do see this accordance crash. Would you like to recover the most recent auto save session? Yes, I sure would uh, because I had some tabs open that I wanted. Okay, few, it's all there. Um, so file, uh, new tab, research, and you can search, uh, may maybe we'll just search dictionaries and we can type in the word theodicy and it will run through all of your dictionaries and give you uh, theodicy wherever it occurs. So here is the dictionary of theological terms. We can magnify this zone. Uh, and I get a snippet here, but I can also open that. So hey, this is great. A very brief definition, which is actually really helpful when I'm coming to new terms and, and, and um, robust concepts. I like to have something short and simple. This even gives me the etymology for the word. So it comes from uh, the Greek theos, God, and decay, justice, or right. So it's uh, it's showing how God is right uh, or, or just uh, the justification of a deity's justice and goodness in light of suffering and evil. The term was coined by the philosopher Gottfried Leibniz, though the issue has long been explored religiously. Well, you know what we want to do. We want to add that to the stack. There it is. So we've got that definition there. Uh, you get the idea. So you could take the word theodicy. Um, I, I want to share with you uh, these tools in particular, uh, the um, two volume history that we've got in accordance uh, it's called apologetics past and present because one of the things i'm going to want to do is see how have apologists throughout time uh, answered this question around the odyssey um, so let me open both of these volume one is let me just get the dates um well, so here we go uh up to 1500 the year 1500 and then volume two would be uh, 1500 to the present day. Um, and so that's split up into two uh, major eras there, this uh, Christian apologetics, past and present. Here's the, the book information. Uh, this has just been released uh, by accordance. Um, so I might take either one of these and I might say, all right, well, how did the earliest, how did people in the first uh, millennium and a half uh, since Jesus walked the earth, how do, how do they talk about, um, Theodicy. And so I could uh, think about what search field that might be. Let's start with titles uh, because I might, well, see, now I don't. And, and I know that because it's not in there. Okay, so it looks like titles will more be people, but I can search it by English content. So Theodicy, and that is not in there. So I know now that I'm going to need to try one of my other terms, uh, like maybe suffering. And you can see that that's there. Some of this is trial and error. Um, some of this kind of, when I do a topical search in accordance, I find that it is as much art as it is science. Accordance is very precise and can do some really complex searches. Uh, sometimes with more topic-based searches, you might just need to be willing to try a few things and see what works and, and what doesn't. I wonder if um, we'll get the Odyssey in this volume two. Uh, yeah, there it is. All right, so one hit in, in volume two. So that didn't really help us. Uh, one thing we can try, though, is just thinking again about uh, going back to our brainstorm list. What are some other questions that are related to uh, the problem of evil? And, and one of them is the existence of God. And so I'm going to go back now to these Christian apologetics modules, past and present. And I'm just going to type in existence and see if that's in a title anywhere. And sure enough, it is. So let's see. Ah, just what I'm looking for. Chapter three, the existence of God. I can click the sidebar here and see who we're talking about. So William Lane Craig, Reasonable Faith, the existence of God. So now he's got here. In fact, you can even expand the triangle here to see um, he's got his argument uh, for the existence of God, this cosmological argument. And he gives you the formulation. Uh, and then analyzes it. This would be worth reading for now. However, we are just going to add it to the stack uh, because I want to have that there. And it will give you the title of the section. Again, it links back so you, you don't need to bookmark it or anything. And it copies and pastes whatever you wanted it to do. So we've got something there on the existence of God. We had another hit. Uh, let's see. 
There's another one, natural theology or evidences of the existence and attributes of the deity collected from the appearances of nature. William Paley, titles were longer in those days. So that might be something that I want to check out here. It looks like he's got quite a bit. Uh, and, and part of the reason I, I find these volumes so helpful already in just the very little bit of time that I've had them is that we don't do apologetics in a vacuum. And there are brilliant, faithful, uh, heartfelt uh, folks who have gone on before us and who have recorded their insights. And so we can access them in this way. I might go back to volume one and do the same thing. Let's just see if there is anything on existence of God in the titles. Um, there is, and this takes me to a name that I don't recognize, but I could advance by hit and get to a name that I do recognize. So here's Thomas Aquinas, whether the existence of God is self-evident. In other words, is that something that you just know naturally, you're, you're born with that. And, and that actually in some ways uh, short circuits the need for heavy lifting intellectually with apologetics. Um, we could talk about that and analyze that, but again, for now, I'll just add it to the stack. I can sort this stuff out later, uh, but using the tools then, this is gonna give me uh, some apologetics resources that I might not get just from the biblical text. However, I also wanna look at the biblical text and uh, let's say, here's a, a great reference. The fool said in his heart, there is no God, Psalm 52.1. So this might be a point in my study uh, where I say, all right, let me just stop here. And again, I'm, I'm giving you the highly abbreviated non-sequential version of this, just so you can see all the different ways you can use accordance. But this would be a place where I might even open up a new workspace. Uh, I might type in, I think it was Psalm 52.1 was the reference. It was Psalm 52.1, we've got a versification issue there. Oh, that's a translation issue. Well, um, at any rate, that's something we would need to sort out at some point. But what I wanted to show you, let's, let's just take John 14, 6, because that was mentioned there too. Uh, all right, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. All right, so this is getting a little further afield from uh, problem of evil, but it's certainly speaking about the existence of God and the existence of God specifically as incarnated in Jesus. So that will speak back into the problem of evil. Um, I mentioned the parallel, uh, the, the info pane um, in the slides as one feature you can use. Um, if you go to add parallel and info pane, it's gonna pull up all of your commentaries, study Bibles, grammars, what have you, that you have in your library that address that particular verse. Uh, so your mileage will vary, you'll have different things here, but I might just go to um, I don't know, the NICNT, New International Commentary on the New Testament, uh, and, and see what, what does it mean for Jesus to be the way, the truth, and the life. And it looks like I'm going to have some pretty good insight on that here. Again, I'm not going to read this all right now. I'm just going to copy it. You can see way speaks of a connection between persons or things. Truth reminds us of the reliability of Jesus. So again, I'll just take that and add that to the stack. And I've got this growing stack with lots of information. So part of my study would be finding relevant verses. We, in fact, we could go back to, I think it was Exodus 3.7. Uh, Surely I've seen the affliction of my people. And uh, you'll notice now a different set of commentaries have shown up. And that's because this info pane is smart. It, it pulls up only uh, resources you have that actually treat that verse. So that NICNT John commentary, of course, will not show up. What does show up is this JPS Torah commentary. By the way, before I clicked it and it opened as a parallel pane, so I could read through all of Exodus and have that uh, eternal, well, not eternally, but I could have that more permanently scrolling with me. But I could also command click or control click if you're on Windows and open it up in a new zone, just a different way to access the same information. You can even, by the way, I love this feature, hover over the book image and get the contents and the instant details uh, and click and hold and see the same thing. So however you access it, um, I just wanna see what this has to say. Uh, one of the, this Hebrew uh, stem is one of the most powerful words in the language, pervaded by moral outrage and soul stirring passion. It denotes the anguished cry of the oppressed, the agonized plea of the helpless victim, and then I have come down, a common anthropomorphic figure of speech. Maybe that's a word I wanna amplify, which is to say, maybe I wanna look that up in another dictionary, uh, but it has to do with God using human language uh, to describe God. Um, 
it used to express God's decisive, decisive involvement in human affairs. So again, I'll add that to stack and I can continue this process for as much time as I have. Um, let me let me get us into organizing mode now. Um, I, I didn't look at outlines of Bible books with you, but I do just want to say that if you are doing a word search, in addition to the info pane, um, you can also open the outlines of Bible books if you have it, which you can open in a parallel pane, but also brilliantly built into this info pane is an outline heading. You can see, remember how when your cursor changes from a pointer to a magnifying glass, that means it's clickable. That opens up this tool called Outlines of Bible Books. I hyperlink that in your uh, in your handout, and that's available in, I, I think, if not every uh, collection, it, the large majority of them in accordance. So it's, it's really easy to get. And so I suspect uh, even if you've got a, a, a starter package or, or something simple that you'll you'll have that. Um, this is helpful for uh, when I'm doing those word searches uh, and I want to dive in and out of passages and see where am I. So here's Exodus 3, 7. Here's the outlines. Now this can follow me. So I go to Numbers 14. They're suffering. Uh, and, and here's what's going on. So that's a really helpful tool that I like to have open in parallel when I'm searching the Bible for these different uh, words. Compassion is a word that comes to mind just now. I might even want to see, um, do God and compassion, where do they occur in close proximity to each other? We didn't get terribly advanced with searching tonight, but uh, one just basic, really good go-to command is the within command. So I can type in God, I can right-click, enter command, and here's within. I've also got a keyboard shortcut. You can also get it from the search menu up here. Enter command within. You don't need to know all those ways, just a way. You can also start typing. So God within, remember this quick entry feature? Well, accordance doesn't know if I want the word within or the command within. So it gives me options. I choose the command. I'm going to say within, let's say within three words. Now I'm going to say compassion. God within three words of compassion. Okay, well, that didn't show up. So again, this is where it's trial and error. So I'll try within six words. I'll need to recognize that God may be referred to with the pronoun as he, and so I might need to broaden that search. Uh, but as things come to mind, I will I will do those searches and, and add them in. Uh, so yeah, all sorts of words you can search in Bible text as well as your tools. We looked at the research function, did a brief overview of that, whether it's the word theodicy. Um, I'll just leave you to explore the topic search if you like. Uh, outlines of Bible books, we talked about a stack. Uh, and, and being aware of other questions that are related. Again, I commend these resources to you. Um, we didn't really look at Montgomery today, but um, there's some other resources you can check out. Uh, and, and these are just some of the features that we use today. Now, what we didn't do was a user tool, nor did we organize our thoughts. So let me just spend uh, just a few minutes wrapping up with that, because depending on your personality type, uh, it, it could um, be really frustrating to end with a stack of great thoughts, but they're not organized at all. So let, let me just speak briefly to that and then we can um, make sure that we're using uh, the remainder of our time uh, for any questions that haven't been answered. So I need my stack and it's gone, I don't see it, so I can get it in a number of places, but I'm just gonna type into my library, problem of evil, there it is, all right. So I've got, uh, you can just scroll through here, here's my brainstorming, here's some Bible passages, here's some more notes that I would have fleshed out. Uh, some dictionary um, uh, entries that are here. And by the way, these um, Christian apologetics resources, they have a lot uh, that speak to this that we didn't look at. So your stack in real life would be more robust than this. But there's a, a couple things you can do with this stack. Um, you can organize by, uh, by importance or sort by importance. So if there is something... Um, Let's say you've got, let, let's just do a new user item, uh, and I'll call this summary conclusions. I try to never leave a stack without some kind of thing like this because presumably I am the closest to this topic right now, uh, you know, closer than I will be when I'm not at the webinar and I'm eating dinner or tomorrow morning when I'm on to a meeting or something else. And so in, in this moment, when I've just been doing the research, I might just write, you know, do some free writing now. Um, things that I've learned, questions that I have. So I might just talk about God is close to those who suffer. Uh, and again, that's pastoral, practical. It's also, there's an intellectual uh, argument to be developed there as well, but I'll just leave that note there. 
uh, I may say soul making theodicy. Um, I buy it or I don't buy it, but I'm going to research it more. And I may just put some questions here. Um, why evil allowed in some cases and not others? Uh, and then I would star this. And now when you sort by uh, importance, your starred stack items will go to the top. You can also use any number of other user tools in accordance. You could use uh, what's called um, uh, paper, um, which has really nice integration with uh, stacks. You can also create a new user tool that would be your own accordance tool um, that would basically be more outline oriented. Both papers and user tools are outline oriented. Let me just um, briefly see if I've got a good, um, well, that one's blank. Yeah, here we go. So here's a, a user tool I use. I, I teach a, a session on systematic theology. Uh, and so with the user tool, um, you can use different headings to make your own outline thing. And you may want to take your stack and put it into this or to use a paper in accordance um, which is another user created module. We could go on all night talking about all the different ways you can uh, store stuff in accordance. And I, I just want to mention a few so you have some things to, uh, maybe you're already using them or maybe you want to go to the help files uh, and look through some of the tutorials or um, the uh, accordance help or readmes or podcasts or what have you and look at more of these. Uh, but that's just one important thing is that I, for me, I would be remiss if all of this research didn't end up in, in some kind of, um, you know, I'm not gonna answer the question of, of the problem of evil, but I, but I might have some concluding thoughts and I, I can put that in the stack uh, or I can decide I, I have a few more minutes and so I'm gonna organize this into a user tool um, and it's gonna be a, a nice outline. And, and so you can use accordance in that way. Now accordance will save this anyway. So you could also, if you get called away, just come back to your stack later. Uh, but especially for those of you for whom it will be frustrating to have a stack of items, uh, do consider starring them and organizing them in that way. And also uh, maybe thinking about something more permanent, like a user tool you create on apologetics with headings and subheadings. And again, you'll find lots of great help sources for that uh, for free uh, within accordance uh, as you want to build your own repository of apologetics. I'm going to stop there and with um, just acknowledgement that this is a vast topic and I'm quite sure I have listed I, I have left things out both in terms of apologetics and in terms of accordance. So there's so much more you can do. My goal has been to equip you with uh, kind of one framework for apologetics. There are other ones too, but we looked at Sire. We, we looked at this head, heart, and hands idea and different approaches in apologetics. Uh, we took a particular case study and talked about how uh, we can use accordance to, to help us get at understanding this problem of evil. Um, so I hope this has been helpful to you. I, I commend to you further study, of course, on any of these questions. And uh, e even if you have a uh, just a, a beginner entry level library, just a few searches is going to give you a lot of information that you're going to be able to work your way through uh, and, and start to get a better understanding of different questions that are, are part of the apologetics task. So let me stop there uh, and just recognizing our time and I will um, check in with our other organizers in particular and see if we have any um, questions that have not been answered or questions that folks might have for me. Thank you so much, Abram. This has been um, uh, thorough, fascinating, powerful. I really love the way you integrated um, uh, all the different aspects of uh, apologetics in, in a meaningful way. Um, we have some, we have, actually we only have one question and one comment and now other than people are now saying well done excellent but if you do have any questions that you'd still like to ask abram now's your time uh, your chance um let me just uh uh one of the comments was um hard sayings of the bible is also a good resource in accordance and uh, yeah yeah if you have any comments on that um yeah yeah thank you yeah no that's great and you know as i, as I was preparing for tonight i, I wish i thought of that because of course you know, my last five minutes of preparing are, uh, what are the hardest questions people are going to ask me? Uh, and my answer is, uh, well, you can go look for those questions in accordance. And this is a great place to do it. Hard sayings of the of the Bible. So yeah, thank you for uh, for mentioning that. That's that's a great resource. You can just see briefly how it's organized here with different questions. So yeah, good good stuff there. And that has a special place in my heart. That was the first module as a 
as a mod, as a content developer here at Accordance that I ever worked on years and years ago. Oh, so nice. It's, it's not Excellent. Time, right? Um, all right. And uh, here's a comment that um, might stretch a little bit. Um, shouldn't the argument um, first define and agree upon what is evil? Um, going back to uh, to the original comments on the problem of evil, if we don't have a common agreement on what is evil, it would probably be impossible to answer how those um, uh, those five questions could all be true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that's such a great point. And in fact, you know, academics get teased, philosophers especially sometimes, for spending the whole first chapter of the book just defining their terms. But there's a reason they do that. And that's absolutely right. In fact, we even see that in thinking about some of the synonyms um, and, you know, just how, how quickly we can stumble over a possible distinction between suffering and evil and sin and there's overlap but then there's uh, you know areas in which those are not the same um so yes thank you for that comment and that question that is excellent and so again for that uh you know i i might think about um i mean there's there's various ways to go about defining terms you could go with uh, i was gonna say the industry standard that's not, not how we talk about uh theology but if there is a kind of commonly agreed on or or often quoted definition uh, you might go with that. But again, that would also be something where I might use um, the research module and see if if I can get a nice uh, handy definition. I might just go to my dictionaries and type in the word evil and see if I get uh, evil as an entry. And interestingly enough, well, here it is in Webster's Dictionary. So I've got something to start with. Um, but yeah, that's here it is in the Theological Dictionary. OK, so I've got some good good starting points here. Uh, that which opposes the will of God. It is both personal and structured oppression that takes shape in societies. It has been defined as the absence or the privation of good. That's Augustine. Distinctions are made between physical and moral evil, natural and intrinsic evil. And in fact, uh, these then become their own sort of subcategories of theodicy is that, okay, well, the free will argument may explain why somebody hurt me, uh, but it may not explain uh, a natural disaster. Um, of course, there could be a connection there, but it, it certainly wouldn't be as obvious or a direct one. So these distinctions get made. So yes, all that to say, thank you so much, whoever mentioned that. Uh, yeah, brilliant point. Define your terms before you begin. Um, and I, I think that, especially in a, just thinking pastorally, um, that's going to help in conversations with other people, making sure you're actually talking about the same thing when you think you are, but but maybe it turns out you weren't. Thank you. Uh, here's another one. Um, um, let's see. Um, oh, a question about how um, to quote from an electronic source you're using. Yeah. I guess in Word or something like that. Yeah, just how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, so let me just open up TextEdit, uh, which is just a, a stripped down Word, um, or yeah, a stripped down text uh, Word processor. Um, so we'll take this entry since we've got it here. I'm going to select it. I'm going to go to right click, uh, which is where I was getting add selection to stack. But I'm going to go here to copy as. Um, and you've got some options here and some keyboard shortcuts. I used to know these all, and I don't use them anymore, so I've forgotten them. But it doesn't matter because you can right click, copy as. Um, and what you're probably going to want is citation, uh, which is going to give you both the quotation and the source. So you've got here's the definition. And then here's the source, and this is hyperlinked back uh, to the location URL in the app itself. If you wanted to, you could also just copy as bibliography, and you'll get just the source information. Now, if you're trying this at home, it may look different from what I have here, and that's because you can customize how you cite things, uh, and that's right here under citation uh, in the preferences. Um, so you can put markers around it, and there's a lot of other settings here. Um, that, that you can uh, adjust if you want to. But yeah, the, the main thing is right click, copy as citation, uh, and that will bring the information with you when you copy and paste it into any other document. Super. Um, here's an interesting question, and I don't know if I know the answer to this, but maybe you do. Um, any way to search for biblical defenses such as Paul and Acts 17 and the difference between statements addressed to those who know the Old Testament scripture and those who don't? Oh, what a question. brilliant question. Yeah. yeah, well, Mark, if you don't know the answer. Um, 
Yeah, and that would take some thought, I think. I think. Yeah. yeah, you know, I, th I think Accordance could help you with that. Um, it would definitely be a multi-step process. I mean, you'd have to establish who the audience of a given book was. So you could do that. Um, I mean, not <laughs> I say that as if it's easy, but you know, just for the sake of argument, let's say, okay, Romans was written to this group. Um, and then you could create a range in accordance and you could you know, call it letters to Gentiles or letter, letters to people who knew the Hebrew Bible or something like that. Again, you'll have to oversimplify. And I suppose that you could search those ranges and then this is where Mark or Rick is going to have to help me out. You could do, could you do an infer search from there to find, well, that, but see, that's not going to answer your question anyway. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, I think that's a great uh, idea. Just the idea of creating a range so that you can search within those specific areas. Um, so yeah. that in itself is really good. And maybe if you go to Acts 17, um, uh, you know, maybe just going to the info pane and seeing what other resources might mention uh, similar um, biblical defenses. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that's great. And in fact, yeah, I would even, um, you know, you you may do well with your um, cross references there in the info pane at that point. Um, and so uh, I've got that somewhere in here. Well, it, anyway, it exists in the info pane. You can do that. Um, and you might even think about uh, like the Bible themes dictionary uh, could be an option there. That's a, that's something that you can search um, by passage, but it will also link back out to other concepts and other passages. So yeah, using a tool like that, that's a great idea, Mark. Um, by the way, um, David Green, Elizabeth's dad, says to say hello. I told him I would oh my pass gosh. that on. <laughs> hello, David. I'm so glad you're here. Um, let's see. Um, uh, question, does Accordance have any plans to continue to reach out to more authors and publishers of apologetics content books primarily to add to their library? I'm currently pursuing my MA in apologetics and would love access to more apologetics books for use in their in classes. Um, let me answer that if, uh, if Abram doesn't mind or, or he can add yeah, to it. Yeah. But um, um, we, uh, we certainly are. And um, in fact, uh, as uh, Rick Mansfield and I were looking at um, Abram's talk, uh, we saw, you know, he, Abram mentioned uh, The Universe Next Door by James Sire, and that's an IVP publication, and we have a great relationship with IVP. Um, Rick and I have both read that book multiple times. It's a, it's a wonderful resource. I can't believe we don't already have that in, in accordance. Um, so I've already sent um an email to uh, uh to initiate the steps in getting that resource from ivp so um we'll be doing that um and uh, again just an excellent resource and uh and yeah well um one of the things uh, you might want to do if you go to the forums from accordance inside of accordance um there's a one of the forum uh areas is for requesting a um uh, a module that you might a resource that you might in, in, you know, want to have in accordance, and that's uh, one of the ways we um, we gauge interest. And um, so, so, and when we, it's important to us. We we uh, we we definitely look at that as we plan our uh, our next development. Um, uh, and so, so yeah, uh, that's a great way to to get that um, in front of our eyeballs. So, yeah. Uh, and I don't see, um, oh, let's see. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. David Green says, we didn't get into Van Til and presuppositionalism. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the next one. I think Mark's taking that one. Oh, no, I'd stay away from that for sure. Um, let's see. Atwood Rice is saying, do you have any intention to look at works by Greg Vanson or Cornelius Van Til, who are by far the great, the best apologists of the last century, going along with um, presuppositionalism? Um, yeah, um, uh, we, um, again, um, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, accordance is, is kind of limited in our, um, in, in our development resources, you know, uh, so we have to really be careful uh, and think carefully about the kind of resources that we're going to develop. Um, and uh, so uh, adding those that should take you right to the module request. You'll need to have an account and sign in, um, which should be pretty straightforward, but you can search and see that, um, if 
the request has already been made for your particular module and just add your voice to that or certainly can create a new topic.